welcome. I'm Beth Meacham. I'm on the board of the library um, and glad to have you here. We are pleased to have Kara Berry, who's an old friend of mine. She has spoken on Van Gogh with the Vermont Humanities Council. She has spent decades researching and traveling to dig into Van Gogh's past. And I'm going to pass it right over to you. OK. Thanks, Beth. Yeah. Thank you for coming. It's nice to be here, and it's always Nice to be able to talk about this artist that I have studied so extensively. And I'll just give you a bit of background why I got so involved with Vincent van Gogh. In 1978, a long time ago, when my husband Steve was studying at Yale Divinity School, there was a professor there called Henry Nouwen. I don't know if anyone's familiar with him. And he actually presented a class that I audited called The Compassion of Vincent van Gogh. And I had not thought of that artist as a compassionate man. I knew, you know, some, most what we all know about him, the starry night, the sunflowers. So I took the class and it opened my eyes to a man of extraordinary depth and compassion and knowledge and passion for lots of things. So I um, didn't do anything with that class for the next uh, 18 or so years, but in the 1990s, after this professor died, I received the notes that he had uh, used for that particular class. And I was asked to do something with these notes. This professor had written many books, but he never wrote anything about Vincent van Gogh. So I had to do something with those notes. I began to lecture. And I began to read all 900 of his letters and books and books and books that he um, ha had himself read, but that were written about him. So I really took a deep dive into this man's life. And uh, the result is not just that I uh, gave lectures, I also have written two books about him. Uh, one on his spirituality and one on his compassion. So he means a lot to me, this artist, and what I will do today, I have several versions of lectures I give about him, because he was such a, um, he was like a, a Renaissance man. He read a lot, he knew everything about art, artists before him and the contemporary artists, so I learned so much about him in that way, and so my lectures will sometimes focus on the art historical aspect or on the literature aspect, um, or just on the footsteps, because I followed his footsteps in France and in Holland. So this time, though, I will just speak to you about nature and some of his gardens. But what I do also want to do is give you a little bit of a biographical background, because most of us are familiar with Van Gogh, but we don't always know much about him. We know, we think we, he cut off his ear and, and committed suicide. Those are some of the dramatic things that are written about and talked about. But there's so much more to this man. So um, what I'll start now saying about Vincent and nature is that he believed that every artist should have a really deep knowledge of nature in order to understand nature, in order to paint nature, in order to incorporate whatever it is around them into their artwork. And by nature, I don't just mean landscapes and gardens that I will focus on today, but also human beings. Human beings were very important to him, and I will, I will get into that a little bit. His deep connection with nature started already as a child. He was born into a pastor's family. His father was a pastor of the little church that you see there in the insert. He grew up in rural Holland, surrounded by fields, surrounded by peasants working the soil. Forever, he was a country boy at heart. Whether he became this big artist or not, what was inside of him started when he was a child roaming the fields around Zundert, the town that he was born in. And he grew up in a religious household. He was very familiar with the parables of Jesus. He was uh, also told that nature is the book which, in which God reveals himself. So when he looked at bird's nests, when he looked at peasants sowing seeds, when he looked at things sprouting up, it wasn't just that, it was more. It was the creator speaking through all of these things. And his life was always focused on his own spiritual understanding. He uh, became eventually uh, not affiliated with any church anymore, but he remained a deeply religious man, a deeply faithful man. 
Well, he spent his childhood here, and around age 16, he was uh, moved to the city of the Hague. And I'm just giving a brief um, summary here. For the next seven years, he was supposed to, by decree of his family, learn to become an art dealer's apprenticeship apprentice. Um, and so he f spent days in very stuffy, overfilled um, galleries to sell art. This is an actual picture of the gallery he worked in in The Hague. The gallery showed pictures of battle scenes and mythology and biblical scenes, but true to his nature, he roamed not the countryside anymore, he roamed the city and he went to other galleries and he went, became familiar with all kinds of artists at the time, contemporary artists, that were painting landscapes, that were painting peasants and workers, subjects that he was much more passionate about. And so for the next seven years, he was searching, he, he was realizing art isn't what you really find in this gallery where I'm supposed to be making the sales. Art is found amongst other people around me, people who understand life, who look at life, who look at the landscape and paint the landscape. So that's what he ended up um, doing more than the selling of the art that he was supposed to do. So he spent a lot of time focusing on other artwork. There we go. One of the occasions during the years that he was an apprentice was the meeting with his younger brother, four years younger brother called Theo, who came to visit him. And the reason I have to mention this is because there would not have been an artist, Vincent van Gogh, without his brother Theo. Theo, although four years younger, ended up becoming the one who supported Vincent for the rest of his life. Vincent never made a living, really. So, um, and this meeting between two teenagers, one was uh, 12, the other one was 16, began the most incredible art partnership that's ever existed, I believe, and an and a association between two human beings that deeply cared for each other and were really soulmates, soul brothers. On the left, you see the first letter that Vincent began to write to, Vin to Theo, and on the right-hand side, this is the last letter, number 652, that uh, Vincent wrote to his brother Theo. In these letters, so much is revealed about art, about literature, about eventually the paintings he would do, but also about his soul. Vincent opened his soul to Theo, and they were, as I said, bonded very, very closely. And Vincent said in one of his last letters, later when he had decided to become an artist, and had not sold anything. He said, at present I do not think that my pictures are worthy of the advantages I have received from you. But once my pictures are worthy, I swear that you will have created them as much as I, and that we are making them together. So we need to always remember, behind Vincent is a Theo. This memory of the walk stayed with him all his life. Well. As I alluded to, he did not like selling the art that he was supposed to sell in the galleries. And now follows several years of not knowing what he should be doing. I'm including this little sketch and I'll tell you why. But he failed at the art dealership. He was dismissed. He did not put his heart and soul in selling the biblical themes and the um, battle scenes and so on. Uh, and he really didn't know what he wanted to do, what he wanted to devote his life to. So there's some years of just searching and failing and working here and failing again. And finally, he thought maybe he should study theology and become a pastor like his father. And it's during this time in Amsterdam, when he's 24 years old, that he made this particular sketch. He sketched all the time, but he never thought that that would eventually become his vocation. But he grew up drawing. His mother loved flowers. He drew the flowers in his mother's garden. He learned about nature through drawing also. And most of his letters will contain sketches that he added to his verbal descriptions. So in Amsterdam, he began to study, but he, that, he failed his entrance uh, studies too. So it's just failure, failure, failure. And finally, he decided to go to a missionary school where he didn't have to learn Hebrew and Greek. He failed that too. But on his own, he then decided, because he was passionate about 
um, becoming a pastor, become about giving um, the gospel message, bringing light to the people who lived in darkness. He decided he would go anyway to the Borinage, which is a very dark mining district in Belgium. There he, on his own, began to minister. He began to uh, help the miners and began to realize there's something else going on in his, in his soul. Um, he was given a probationary period, but again dismissed by the Missionary Society because he was taking his missionary work too seriously. He gave everything away that he had. He, he basically took what he was told as a Christian follower, a follower of Christ, give everything you have to the poor. And he did. But that's not what the Missionary Society wanted him to do. So we find him here at about uh, 24, 25 years old, again, not knowing what to do, destitute, sort of abandoned by the church, by his family also. But it is precisely in this very low moment that the desire of sketching starts to bubble up even stronger. And this is really in the Borinage, in the area where it was dark, where he was poor, where he was liberated actually from being, uh, doing what society wanted him to do, that he decided he would make sketches. He would start to draw. And so you just see um, one of the crude drawings on the right that he did for other miners. Because he was so knowledgeable about art, artists did inspire him. And one of the ones that inspired him the most was Millet and Rembrandt, who could tell stories, who could tell very impertinent stories about life through their art. So he thought, if they can do it, I will try to do and he, that too. And this is what, uh, what is the beginning of his art career, which I find quite phenomenal. And because he was poor, because he had no profession really yet, no money, he went back to his parents' home, and that was in a little town of Etten, and this is where he started to self-teach himself. He's a self-taught artist. He really hardly took any classes at all. And here he is, back in the countryside, connecting with the laborers, the peasants, having Millet, the artist, as his um, wonderful example to emulate, but different from Millet and from the artist of his time is the fact that he didn't romanticize the peasants. They had to look like they were toiling. They had to look like they had dirt on their hands and they were really working. So here he's really beginning to do much of his um, practicing of the human body. And because he had uh, difficulties living with his parents, he decided to leave and go on his own to The Hague. Again, in The Hague, he um, was able to uh, rent an apartment that was paid for by Theo. So Theo is now supporting Vincent wherever he goes. And uh, he's looking upon a garden, so to speak, but not a rural garden. It's a, it's a carpenter's yard, it's called. But as you can see, he has done some tremendous work on himself. He has mastered some perspective drawing. This is, you can see the three-dimensionality in the sketch. So he's beginning to really um, learn his, his skills. In The Hague, he also began to paint. Up to now, he was sketching. Now, I just want you to look at the colors he's using in this, in this painting. Would you all know, if you looked at this, that this was a Van Gogh? Is he recognizable in this work? If we know, you know the sunflowers and the starry night, this is, just, this is a Dutch painting with Dutch colors, not just from the climate, but also from the palette point of view. But he's working on perspective, on practicing what he can do. In The Hague, there's a lot to that story. He also still tried to minister to people. He took in some poor people, he, especially a woman called Sien, a prostitute. He hoped to change her, minister to her, show her a better way of life. It didn't work. Artists that he had met in The Hague began to um, shun him because he let himself in with low people. He got his models from the soup kitchens, from, you know, where he had not enough money. So he was on his own again, and he realized he couldn't keep it up in The Hague. He escaped once again <laughs> on his own to another 
quite dark place, like the Borinage, like the um, mining district was, in Drenthe, it's north of Holland. And this is where the greatest transformation then still uh, was completed to him becoming an artist. Because in this place, where he was again utterly alone, he decided he couldn't also minister physically, taking care, helping the poor, giving away his bread and his clothing or whatever he had done, if he wanted to make any strides with his art as an artist. So he really, from now on, is devoting his whole life to his art and his art become his religious vocation. It is with his art he wants to minister. He wants his art to touch people. He wants his art to uplift the lowly, the marginalized, the peasants, the people that you don't see hanging on the gallery walls. The peat diggers, for example. And he will, he will paint the peasants over and over again. And he also wants to eventually put paintings in people's homes that uplift them, that give them joy. This is not a pa such a painting yet, or these three examples you have here, because they're dark, but he's painting what he sees. Vincent never made things up. Well, there are a few. Starry Night is one of them. But mostly what he painted on canvas is what he connected with in nature, with the people or with the landscapes. After three months in Dante, he again couldn't take his loneliness anymore, his yearning to be with other people. He went back to his parents' home, which was difficult, but at least he had a place to be. And in this home, which is now in another parish. He spends, I think, about uh, two years working on the landscapes, working on drawing the peasants and the rural people. This is the place he painted the famous potato eaters, if you're familiar with that painting. Um, dark, this is his mother's kitchen garden. And um, again, it gives you not just a pretty picture to hang on the wall, because he said art does not have to be beautiful. Art has to be truthful. Art has to show and help you connect with what's out there. So this is really uh, showing you the spirit of a place, which he does over and over again, rather than a photographic, fantastically detailed image of what he sees. He pours in his soul and his own feelings that he has when he looks at the paintings. So Vincent becomes really the first expressionist artist because with his art, he wants to express what he feels when he looks at his art. Well, um, after the two years with his parents, there was a final break. His father actually died while he was there. And because he was a pastor, that meant the pastor's family had to move out of the parsonage. And he had nowhere to go again. His mother was able to go to a, a sister, but he got on a train <laughs> and without much warning, arrived in Paris, where at this time Theo was working as an art dealer. Theo didn't know what hit him. This, this passionate man, his brother whom he loved, but he had never lived with him that way. But Vincent spends two years in Paris now. And for me, I always feel this is the greenhouse where he encounters the impressionist artists. He encounters Japanese art. He encounters so many different m movements in a way and also colors. Paint tubes are invented, new colors that he did not have in Holland. So all of a sudden he is in a place where everything is beginning to open up. And this is where he starts to paint with the brush strokes he's so fam we are so familiar with, the broad brushes, the unfinished look, the colors side by side that mingle. So this one is one of his first paintings he, uh, he did in Paris, it's Montmartre, and it almost is another kitchen garden, as you can see. Uh, that's the way it looked in those days. Paris was not yet so fully developed. But you can see there is a tentative trying out of new colors on this palette. And, you, and I left the behind so you can see the difference. But now wait and see, see this painting. What a difference from what he did in Holland. He has a much greater palette and you can imagine how fervent he was to try out all the colors. This is a park at Asnier, and he is using what he is so familiar with, the dots, the lines, the squiggles, the all kinds of shapes to create texture, to create the, the verdancy and the foliage that he sees in front of him. So from now on, we'll see colors in his work. 
And he also believed that color wasn't just about what was on the object. He could, um, he could exaggerate colors. He could make colors speak. He studied color theory. All through this time, he is reading about colors, he's looking at artists, he's writing letters to Theo, having Theo send him paints, and so on. But he is um, realizing that color has a force of its own. You don't even have to recognize what's on the painting, but the color will already touch your soul. That German um, poet that I like so much, Johann Wolfgang Goethe, <laughs> said that color is the language of the soul. So when you go outside and you see colors, they're working on you on a certain level. It's, it's really quite powerful. And Vincent knew that, and he used it. He installed himself in Arles after he left Paris. Two years was enough for him in that greenhouse of incredible art activity. And Theo, I think, was relieved that Vincent left because it was difficult for him to live together. True to Vincent, he got on a train and wasn't quite sure he, was, where he was going to take, uh, get off. And he saw beautiful landscapes around the little town of Arles, which is in the south of France. And he got off the train. That's it. That's where he stayed for the next year. <laughs> and he eventually, of course, thanks to Theo, found a place to rent. And where he lived was in this, this house here. This is called, we call it the yellow house. Um, that no longer exists today, unfortunately, but the building behind it is still there. But that was torn down at some point. But in this yellow house, he had such a desire to make it a place where artists would come and paint together and make it an artist community. The only artist who did come was the artist Paul Gauguin. He made it there for three months because Theo told him, I want you to be with Vincent. He is lonely. He needs to start this artist community. And, and Gauguin said, yes, I'll go. But he got something in return. Theo was, would uh, sell his paintings for him. But it's in this house that Vincent really painted the most of his paintings. He only has um, how many more? Two more years to live from now on. So most of the paintings that we know and that are hanging in all the galleries around the world happened in, partly in Paris, but mostly in Arles, and then the next year when he left to go to another place. So that's amazing to think. He put out paintings, one a day, two a day, including sketching and so on. So he did a lot during this time. And because, uh, the reason I have those sunflowers on this painting is that he created those fantastic, famous sunflower paintings as a welcome for Paul Gauguin. He wanted his house to sparkle with art and to be a welcoming um, place for him. So he created many different uh, versions of his sunflowers. He's so famous for the sunflowers. But uh, Arles is a very medieval town, also goes back to Roman time. There's many ruins. It's very picturesque. Tourists go there because it's a beautiful old town. But Vincent wasn't drawn to the old town. What he was drawn to, true to his country boy nature, was what was growing around the town, outside the walls of the city. And at that time when he arrived, it was um, in the spring, the fruit trees were blooming. And he even wrote to Theo, for God's sake, in, in his letters, get the paints to me without delay. The season of orchards in, in blossom is so short. And you know these subjects are among the ones that cheer everyone up. So Theo was sending by train, you know, all kinds of colors that Vincent um, ordered. And he made many paintings in these orchards. Now, one of the things he wanted to express was not the fleetingness of an impressionist artist who just wanted to create the light bouncing off the object, but he wanted his subjects, to have more presence, more subject. You, you needed to feel the, um, the essence of growth and blossoming. And these became sort of emblems for him of new life, of they will fade, the fruit will ripen, they will die, the leaves will fall off, but next year it's all going to happen again. So what he wanted to express in many of his nature paintings was the transiency, but also the eternity everything is going to happen again. It's a cycle. The sower will sow the seeds, the leaves and the buds will come again. So his trees really have solidity. 
There's so many beautiful ones uh, to show. But he is traveling around the area of Earl, not so much inside, and he finds all kinds of interesting places. Probably not scenes that most artists of his day would focus on. This is just a scraggly little oak tree growing out of a knoll in the garden of a, a ruin, of a ruined uh, fortress. And it caught his eye. He always saw things that most people didn't. The lowly, the not so fantastic, but he uplifted things on his, on his, on his, uh, on his canvases. And I like, I like the presence of this oak tree. It's again more about the characteristics of the oak than a beautiful picture of an oak tree. It's, it's the gnarled way of growing in a very unfriendly, you know, rocky surrounding. He's making it. It's a tough little tree. Then here, he is in Arles, inside the city, and Steve and I were, did travel there, and what, what he was drawn to again were gardens and trees and foliage and verdancy. So this is the entrance to the public garden in Arles, and if you can see, that's, it's the same entrance right here that we were standing at. So um, and he has people. People are part of his, uh, oftentimes part of his paintings. But just imagine when you look at a scene, oh, trying to separate the different trees. You know, you could tell what's a, what's a pine tree and what's a um, um, deciduous tree. But there's no detail, no photographic detail, because that was not what he was trying to show. He wanted to show you the character. This is another uh, beautiful scene inside the public garden. And he calls it the poet's garden, because he writes to Theo, um, you know, as almost you can imagine that the poets like Dante and Boccaccio and Petrarch are strolling here discussing poetry. I mean, he had a vivid imagination. And this is, this is what he felt. Very, very verdant and uh, lush. And that's where he felt at home in such a surrounding. The fields around Arles were also where he felt at home because uh, his growing up years in the rural southern Holland were always full of growing wheat and whatever it was grown in those places. So he was drawn to the wheat fields everywhere he went. And this is an early spring picture. You have beautiful irises in the foreground. Uh, Arl is in the background. And it's just a woven together picture with his brush strokes. What he talked uh, about in his letters was that nature is dictating to me and I take it down in shorthand. So he has his uh, way of surrounding things with a darker line or just you know, indicating where is grass, where is wheat, where the color. So he is practicing daily. He's out there in the, in the heat of the summer painting from life with his easel, holding it down sometimes on the ground, his, his, his canvases because of the strong wind. And he would write about little flies getting stuck in his oil paint. <laughs> and if you actually go to any kind of uh, museum and look at his art, you may find some flies in there still. But this is the ripening wheat field now. He's progressing through the season, which he loved to do. He loved to show, again, as I said before, the cycle of nature. And here you have, of course, the fall. So he's in Arles for a whole year. Beautiful colors and sketchy, and yet you can see what it is. Sometimes the sky looks even as he used his hands to just spread the paint. And if you look at the, the, the cypress trees, as tall trees, just sketchy little daubs of paint, and yet he's able to you know, as establish what they are. One of the themes that never left him was the sower. And I don't know if you remember that picture of Bilet, the sower, in the beginning. He is still, he's not copying it anymore because he internalized the uh, figure of the sower. And this is probably one of those paintings that he didn't necessarily sit outside and paint because this is an interesting one. You have the sower sowing his seeds in the foreground. And if you can tell, the ripe wheat is in the background. So it's really a whole, the whole cycle is in this 
uh, painting. And so I almost think it's like a parable in paint. You have the new life, and then you have the wheat that will die and be ground into flour, and then you'll have the kernels that are left over that will be sown again into the ground. And above this all, science is incredibly strong sun. And for Vincent the sun, because he was, um, he often uh, used symbols, symbolical things and emblematic things. For him, the sun symbolized the divine, the creative force around him. So almost the, the sun beams are as solid as the wheat. It was part of the whole. And the divine was very much present in his life. He always felt it, he spoke about it, read about, uh, wrote about it. And then very often also, pay attention to some of the other paintings, there's a path at the bo bottom of the painting which kind of invites us <laughs> to get in there, to, to experience this. There's another one with a path. And I, it's one of the gardens around Arles. So I, he made many of these too, full of flowers, riotously blooming. But he often also took his reed pen, which he loved, and he did sketches. Sometimes he sketched the garden after he painted it, sometimes before. But he loved uh, the, the, the textures and the, and the contrast of the black and white. And you can see his shorthand, you know. <laughs> He's able to create the different plants, the different flowers, the different trees, with his lines and his dabs and his circles. And he painted fast. We have to. He would have never made so many paintings. Because he was, I can imagine, totally oblivious to anything outside of what he was doing and his connection with nature. He neglected himself. His health wasn't good because he poured his whole soul into this. And he poured it into this because he felt this is what people should be hanging in their dark homes that he remembered in Holland. This will give them joy. This will connect them to not just nature, but also the greater creation. So this is one of the reasons he painted these things. And then sometimes he sat on the ground and painted close up. Now on the left, you have just a lovely uh, image of the moth, probably that's what he wanted to uh, paint. But then on the right, just some dried thistles. And I mentioned before, there was nothing too lowly for him to put on his canvas. He was intrigued by the colors, by the lines, and he was able to create a, a painting just like that for himself. Some of this was just because he wanted to, um, to paint something that caught his eye, that he connected with. Now the next one is one of my favorites. And I'm not sure I can exactly tell you, but it's just, it's maybe the colors of green and red. Their passion. He always said that the, the complementary colors of red and green can express human passion. They're the most intense combination. But it is, a, it is just, I don't know, it's just a beautiful painting to me. Intense. Again, it's not a painting that another artist would have done. He would have probably wanted something more symmetrical, something more exact. This is just some scraggly corn that was not harvested, that was left standing. Something, somebody forgot to take them. <laughs> and he, he said something about uh, this painting and about corn in a letter to Theo. Uh, it said, um, if I am worth anything later, because this is, he's not gotten any painting sold, nobody has really paid attention to his work. Uh, Theo, who has received some of the paintings in Paris that Vincent has been sending him, um, is not able to sell Vincent's art. They're, they're into impressionists, more pretty pictures and more frivolous and the life of Paris pictures. But they're not into this sort of passionate uh, way of painting. They've, they've not yet caught on. So Vincent says, if I'm worth anything later, I am worth something also now. <laughs> For corn is corn, even if people think it is grass in the beginning. So he identified with nature. He identified with some of the things that you could see out there. I'm not yet worth something. And Theo believed in him. Vincent did believe in himself too. Someday, his paintings would speak to people. 
This one is a lovely one too. Um, the vineyards in Arles were green at the time he got there. And if I, I paint a little bit, but if I was sitting in front of a vineyard with all this green stuff, I wouldn't know where to begin. <laughs> And yet you can tell, I think, that it is a vineyard. You can see some of the gnarly roots. You see some people walking there, arms in the background. It's called the Green Vineyard. And he, again, wanted to um, show people this is what your wine <laughs> starts out as. This is what nature is offering us. From this comes the good, the good harvest, which he painted in another painting. That's also one of my favorites. And you may be familiar with this one. I don't know. It's called the Red Vineyard. And this was painted in the fall. Um, and what caught his eye was the fact that you had these rich oranges and yellows of the leaves of the, vi of the vines. And you had the complementary color of blue from the smocks of the peasants. So it's, it's a really rich tapestry of colors that are um, juxtaposed, which means they enhance each other a little bit more. And the sun, of course, above everything. To me, it's an ode to joy, the joy of the harvest of grapes. Yeah. Hard work, yeah. I wonder, I wonder if we see the richness better. You know, I'm, I'm looking at it, I think so too, but it was because of the filming that we left the Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Should we? Kind of faded. It's very faded. It's not that way on, on my laptop here. Yeah. yeah. Faded in the filming, so. That's a yeah. little bit better, maybe. Better. Yeah, I'm, I'm so better. sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I know. It would help to have some of this down, but it's a little bit better now. Yeah, because when I talk about the rich colors, it's richer in real life. Yeah. This is one of the last paintings he painted in Arles all during these times when he was working on this, this other artist, Paul Gauguin, had come to paint with him. And it was supposed to be a nice, uh, mutually uh, enhancing and encouraging experience, but it wasn't. <laughs> because Paul Gauguin had totally different ideas about art than Vincent. And Vincent argued. He argued, he, he felt strongly about the way he painted. So I'm showing you this particular painting now and tell you that this is what happened, this was what preceded the ear incidents. Does everybody know that Vincent supposedly cut off his ear? His ear was injured and he suffered the, of uh, seizures from then on. He, he had a breakdown because Gauguin threatens to leave and he did. And Vincent's dream of having an artist colony was shattered. <coughs> Vincent was very sensitive. Uh, he wanted friendships. He wanted to have, um, be surrounded by people he cared for. This shattered him. Um, the ear, ear incident we can maybe talk about later, but it set him down into a spiral of, um, from now on, reoccurring seizures, like epileptic seizures, we could imagine uh, that. Um, so once he had that seizure and Gauguin left, uh, Vincent had to be hospitalized. He was in the hospital for a few months in Arles, and this is um, a beautiful hospital, actually. It still exists today. Um, in this hospital, there was a progressive doctor. He continued to paint when he was a little bit better, when he could. Um, he could go back to his yellow house for a little while, and then he had another seizure, and he was sent back to the hospital. The last time he was in that hospital, the citizens of Arles decided this man is not going to come back. He's crazy. They, they deemed him crazy because he did have those seizures and he did, they believed, cut off his ear. Um, so they boarded up his yellow house. He could not go back. He stayed in this hospital for a little while, but as I said, it was progressive and the doctors there allowed him to paint. And that's what kept him going because he has one more year to live and he still has some very famous paintings to paint. So in this hospital, he painted what he saw, and he painted for his own healing. This was not necessarily a painting he, he meant for us to, for us as much as it was for him to be grounded in his, in his, uh, in his own being. Before he left Arles, there's another painting he was able to do 
when he was still outside of the hospital. And for me, this is also a beautiful painting um, that I value, not just because of the colors, <laughs> and because it's kind of strange. Which artist would paint a tree trunk right in the middle, in front of, of the view? Um, and he writes about it. He writes the snake-like, you know, creeping above. And that's what you focus on, the first thing you see. But when you look beyond the tree, you begin to see the blossoming orchards again. So he's come full circle. He's been at R for a year. He sees an, an, uh, a man there working in the fields, but the orchards are back in bloom. And because Vincent expressed himself through his art too, this is almost telling us, yes, you will have difficulties. And they will obscure your view. But look beyond. There is a whole life there. There is other things to be grateful for that are celebrating life. So he almost is convincing himself, I am in a big, bad place now. But nature is still blooming. It's still going on. And that's what he focused on. But as I said, his yellow house was boarded up, and he couldn't return. So again, like previous times in his life, he was almost homeless. He didn't know where to go. But fortunately, not far from Arles is a little town called Saint-Rémy in the south of France. And he knew that there was an asylum, an old um, monastery that for the last thousands of years had um, accepted people who could not live on their own, who had some either mental anguish or some hardship, and they were able to come into that asylum into that uh, monastery and seek help. There was a doctor there, uh, and Vincent signed himself in on his own in this place. And he spent another year here. And in this place, he painted voraciously also another doctor who thankfully was very progressive and knew that this patient, if we, they wanted to help him, needed to have his paints. So they gave him a room to sleep in, a, pain, a room to paint in, and a room to store all his material. And meanwhile, Theo is sending him the paints and the paper and the canvas. But in this asylum, he had a room which almost reminds you of the painting he did with the tree in the middle of the canvas. He had bars in front of his view. Because most of the time when he was recovering from a seizure, when he was tired, he had to stay in his room. And that's how he had to look at nature. And beyond the barred window was a walled garden. At the time we were there, lavender was growing. But at the time Vincent was there, there was wheat growing. He's again in, in um, Saint-Rémy in the spring. So he's painting from, the, from through the bars the walled garden. And this is the young wheat that's now beginning to grow. And he's um, going to be working on this view for the whole time he's there. In between his seizures, when he has recovered and had his treatment, and you know they were caring for him quite well, he was allowed to go outside of the walls. But in the, in the times that he was recovering from his seizures, he, he remained there, painting from behind the bars of the window. This is the wheat now getting a little bigger and riper. And, the and everything is just animated. And that's what we find in this last year of Vincent's life, is that he responds to the energy he feels in nature. Every line has an energy to it. You almost see the, the wheat moving in the wind and the clouds burgeoning up. He's painting his own passion, his own you know, vulnerability, his own woundedness. But he's painting also to show us this is, this is what's worth it. This is nature. This is, we are part of this, like in this painting here. I love this one, too. It's the uh, harvest now. He's been there almost nine months. And it's the, the reaper. And he said, it's not a drab image of death, because he's doing it, and, it, and he's doing it almost smiling. It's a joyous image. <laughs> the, the wheat is being harvested. It's a beautiful, um, and he, has, he writes about this many, in many of his letters. But it's also 
what I call um, his woven look. His brush strokes almost create a, pat uh, a tapestry. And within that tapestry is not just the wheat, but it's a human being. And the human being, is, his life is also like the wheat. You, he's born, he ripens, he dies. And he's born, humanity keeps going. So he often will write about the symbolism of the wheat as compared to humanity. Then he just paints wherever he goes. This is a bush. Anybody recognize what kind of bush this may be? We have them in Vermont all over by homes. Any, hmm? It's no lilac. lilac. It's lilac. Yeah. See again, it's not a, a, you know exact, but he's tried to capture the characteristics of the lilac, and that probably wasn't just bursting with fragrance and bloom. And he sat down with his easel and he painted it. Path again leading in there, but this is right around the building that he was in. And I was there in this asylum, and spoke to the current doctor who was there, and he allowed me to go in where the patients usually are. And I saw this fountain, and I said to myself, I've seen this in his paintings somewhere, or his drawings. So I took a picture, and I was allowed to take a picture because there were no people in, in the vicinity. And then sure enough, we see the, the fountain that he drew, still with his reed pens. And the water, of course, in the middle, you can see a whitish line, that's the water spouting up. So Vincent spent a lot of time in the asylum, in this monastery garden, where the monks used to walk and meditate. He became like a monk, in a sense. He contemplated. He um, was one with whatever he saw. And this is another one, another example of the garden inside the asylum. It's cool, it's beautifully, you know, on a hot day to look at this, you almost feel the coolness of it. Ivy growing up the trunks inside the garden, and this is a sketch he did. So there are days he sketched. Um, he also felt that, and he wrote about it, uh, when he sent this particular painting to Theo in Paris, Paris was congested and hot and dusty, he said, Theo, just hang this up and look at it. It'll transport you to this very cool and beautiful place of repose. So he found healing here. You know, he was able to rejuvenate himself. He, he talks about such a garden also, having read about it in books like from Emil Zola. Whenever he sees things, he will always think of something else too. That was so remarkable about Vincent. There's too much to talk about that too. But he would always think, this artist did that, or this writer ex described a garden just like this, where healing could take place. And this one's a famous one, and it also happened in this garden. Anyone familiar with this painting? He sat on the ground to paint the irises. And it's, it's a beautiful painting where you can realize that he um, had to communicate with these irises. They're sketchily done, yet they're irises. So I call it, he, he painted the irisness of the iris. He painted the essence of the iris. And that's what he was always after, to get the essence of what he saw. And again, he's using some of the complementary colors. He's probably making the red of the soil a little redder or a little more orange, so that it would um, have a more, of a big, more of a contrast. Oftentimes, when he uh, was overwhelmed with his seizure, also with reading, he was reading Shakespeare at the time he was in the asylum, and that was heavy. He said, if, if it's too much for me, all I need to do is go out and look at a pine tree or look at a blade of grass. So I love some of these details. I'll give you two more of just what he saw and what helped him overcome his, his um, fatigue and his, his ailing. He could be rejuvenated by looking, but he painted it too, so it's, it's even deeper. And he also um, read Walt Whitman a lot, who wrote about a blade of grass was no less than the motion of the stars. So if you look at a blade of grass, you see the universe. Walt Whitman wrote some beautiful poems, and Vincent believed that too. This is just grass. How many artists do you know that would just sit <laughs> on a field. This is like the fields we just were driving through when we came from Eden this afternoon. Tufts of grass and other things growing in the middle. 
And Vincent, yes, another one. I, anybody know the flowers? Dandelions, yeah. The lowly, <laughs> again, you know, he, he would focus on things that most artists would not focus. A field of dandelions. Again, that was something he, he, he felt connected with. And this is, an art, this is a painting that um, he created when he was allowed to leave the asylum and go for a walk outside the walls of the monastery. He had an assistant that would come with him. And again, it's beautiful, passionate colors of reds and greens. And the perspective is drawing you into the painting. He loved roaming. He would put on his easel and he would go out and the um, assistant would follow him. Then around the asylum, still today, are these olive groves. And uh, wandering through them, we could feel what Vincent may have felt. This old, old groves that, that trees are sometimes thousand years old. They're gnarled. They have withstood lots of storms and struggles in life. And Vincent could identify with those struggles. So he painted them several times, different versions. Lots of energy, lots of passion, his suffering, lots of things coming through in this painting. But they spoke to him, and he, re he resonated with those olive trees. I just put this one in here. These are four images that he created in, in Saint-Rémy, and they show a little bit that he also painted his own struggles. In the left top, it's, it's a marble quarry that's right there next to the asylum. And inside the quarry, you can barely see a few people struggling. And for him, that was the way he felt when he was in one of his seizures. He would almost drop into a black hole and would have to fight to get out. And so you have on the right, it's a gorge with water coming through and tumbled rock. And people, too, on the, on the, on the pathway, struggling to get through. So it's his own struggle. And then coming out of his, um, <laughs> his seizure and back into life a little bit, the melancholy or the mood of darkness is still hanging over him. But then all of a sudden he's free again and he's triumphantly enjoying life in its full colors. So to me, when I often talk about his life, I put these together because he painted so much. And some of this is, is part of what he was going through as his own struggles. Well, after a year in Saint-Rémy, he wasn't getting any better. His seizures kept on um, plaguing him. Theo in Paris said, I want you closer. Theo had married, he had a child, and he wanted to um, have Vincent a little bit closer. So Vincent got on a train again. This time, he knew where he was going. He was going to a little town called auvers sur oise not far from Paris. And here he spent the last 70 days of his life, and he painted 70 paintings. He donned his easel and he went out uh, and painted. And he again was amongst the, the rural, the poor also, the peasants and, and the gardens that he loved. So he, he found some solace there. Um, this is his doctor, Gachet. And the reason I'm putting it there is because he also painted Gachet's garden. And Gachet was a very strange man who Vincent felt needed help just like he did. Uh, he was also melancholy and, and, and suffered some you know, depressions. So the garden that he painted to me is almost like, this is Gachet, a little bit you know, off. <laughs> not smooth, not wholesome. There is something going on, a struggle too, when you have that passionate red and the green. So he painted Gachet. And I'm showing you another one that I also love. It's a little bit unfinished. I don't know if you can tell, but there's less paint on there. He was running out of paint a lot in, the, in this last 70 days. So he just sketched more than anything here. But again, focusing on the little vineyards, the gardens, the uh, thatched roofed cottages that he remembered from his Dutch childhood. So he's, he is in his element here, but he's also suffering still with his seizures, knowing that he may not get better. This is um, actually an image, a sketch, from his last letter that he wrote to Theo. So we're coming to a close of his life. This is the painting he worked on, which is a garden, again, of a, of a poet who lived in Auvergne. 
Um, and he writes about it in his letter. He says, I need to finish it. You need to send me more paint. And um, is, is very involved still with this painting. But it is his last painting um, of, of this time, of these 70 days. Because we don't know quite what happened. But he was out one day. He was living in, a, in an inn. And he went out with his easel into the wheat fields to look for subjects to paint. Because at this time, also, the wheat fields were ripe. And as you know from Arl, he loved to paint the wheat. In this particular day, he was uh, in the wheat fields intending to paint. But for some reason, he was wounded with a gunshot. And he struggled back to the inn without his painting easel and everything. And um, he died two days later in his inn at the age of 37. So all these paintings he's done, he's, he's come to the place in his life where he was still painting. But it was cut short. And there is more to this. But he was surrounded by these wheat fields. And when Steve and I were there, I don't know how many years ago, now maybe 10, the wheat was ripe. It was as he would have probably seen it. So I felt very connected with Vincent at the time. Um, Vincent, it was considered to be a suicide. So he was not uh, buried in the little church in town. He was brought to a cemetery outside of town. And that's just an image of his grave in a, in a um, cemetery on the outskirts of Auvergne. He was buried there. Not too long afterwards, Theo also died of a broken heart, but he also was ill. And um, his widow eventually had Theo's bones brought to the cemetery. So the two brothers could be resting together with ivy intertwining their two graves. So um, Vincent's paintings were um, with the widow of Theo, who almost, you know, she didn't know what to do with them, but she kept them. And thanks to her, we have all the paintings today. And I'm going to leave you with one more painting. And that will be the last one for today. The image of the sower, which Vincent never abandoned in many of his works. They were always peasants. I've shown very little of them, but this is one that I love. It's a very modern painting. It's very different from the one we saw before. Um, he's using intense colors. He's using the sun almost as a halo of the, of the sower, as an emblem for new life. So whether his life was cut short, but his paintings are still speaking about what he discovered nature was teaching him. And he wrote this beautiful sentence in, the, in one of his letters to his sister, that what the germinating force is in a grain of wheat, that is love in us. We have that creative power in all of us. And that's what he, so he always connected everything in his life to uh, the creative force that he felt surrounding him. And um, I have just a few quotes of some of the letters where he mentions the sower. And he mentions the mission of his paintings. Because what he wrote to Theo is that I want to bring peace to poor people and help them reconcile with their existence on earth with the paintings that he made. I want to comfort with the intensity of my coloring. I want people to see the movement of the seasons in the Provence. And most of all, I want to paint infinity and eternity in the stars, in the eyes of a child, and in the movement of the sower. So Vincent's language is one of comfort and compassion and beauty and creativity. And that's what I leave you with. <laughs>
because he was a very loving man. Very often you hear about Vincent as being difficult and he, you know, cut off his ear and he had all these strange, I don't know, there's lots of dramatic stuff that's written about Vincent van Gogh, but in his heart he was a very loving man and he wanted to express that. And because he didn't do it verbally anymore, he wasn't preaching like his father was a preacher, his language was art. So that's, that's how he tried to express himself. So, yeah. When did his art start to become okay. popular and how did it yeah. how did it evolve? That's such a good question because at the time of his death, he had only sold one painting and that was that red vineyard and it was sold to a friend. So at the time of his death, as I said, Vince, Theo's widow had all those paintings rolled up in her apartment in Paris. And she left Paris to go to Holland, um, and she bro brought all of that with her. And eventually, with help of other artists, she started to show them. And other artists who had known Vincent began to see his work for what it was. And just very slowly, with little exhibits here and there, but in, I think it was 19 or in the early part of the 20th century, there was an uh, exhibition in New York, the Armory Show. And that had brought modern art from Europe for the first time to, the Ameri to America, to New York. And New York then became the art center. And in that show were four of Vincent's paintings. So Pollock, for example, Jackson Pollock was inspired by Vincent. Some of those expressive artists were inspired by Vincent. And so starting from 1911 or so, more and more of his art was demanded and people started to buy art. And it just, just went up and up and up. For example, that painting of the Dr. Gachet sold, I don't know, about 10 years ago for $86 million. It was one of the highest prices, yes. Now his paintings, <laughs> that's what you need to, to be able to buy one. But it, it was at first slowly, but then all of a sudden it just went wild. And now every museum in the world has a, has a painting by Vincent, and he often painted more versions than one. You know, his, um, yeah, his wheat fields. There are several that he would paint again and again. So some museums have similar paintings, in other words. Yeah. Oh, pardon? Any children of his own? No, um, he wanted a family. And unfortunately, the family he wanted, or the, 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 the closest he came to having a woman in his life was a, a prostitute in The Hague. She had children of her own, um, and that he cared for them. He, he did lots of things, but he then, when he gave up, remember that dark place in the North of Holland where he, he no longer took anyone in, he knew that he would not have a family anymore. But he had a nephew. Theo had a son. I'll come to you in a minute. Theo had a son, and Theo's son, is the one who um, initiated the building of the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. So he then, all the paintings that he still had from his mother, he then put into that museum. So, yeah, you had a question, I think. Well, one thought I had was the, the painting with the cornstalk. Yeah. Um, because he had, because he was so versed in the Bible, I was wondering if he, maybe he was thinking about gleaning in the corn for the poor? Most likely he did. You absolutely, thank you. That's great that you say that because I did not make that connection. The gleaning was, was there are several stories in the Bible with that. And another thought that was different was the one where um, there are the trees and there's some water in front of them and then Arles is behind. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I forgot exactly what you said, but the, about, people and something and, and and I was looking at it like like the front part was like nature yeah and then the back part was people taking off from that and what the people were doing and I and then there were a couple of places where he had water and his reflections in the water were wonderful to look at and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how he used water in his paintings no actually I don't have a thought about that um he didn't paint too many pictures with water, so I don't know. He just, he, it was in his view, so he painted what he saw, but I don't, didn't, haven't, no, don't know more about that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> he's quite an artist. And 
you know, new things are still coming out. Another painting was discovered by him, so he's still in the news, you know, as, as somebody. It's great to see paintings I've never, ever seen. Yeah, this. yeah, I know. That's what I, I chose that a little bit. You know, I could have shown you Starry Night, which I also love. But, uh, and, and there are some, like, you know, we're maybe more familiar, but, but you don't see them all, you know, unless you go to lots of museums or have a book. But yeah, there are many, many art, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he paints beautiful images of, of people, too. Um, and, and you can tell that, you know, he's feeling with them. He's, he's, and he wants to uplift them. He wants to tell them, you are important enough to be on my canvas, you know. And, and in that The Hague, when he did that carpenter's yard, when he was in a tenement house there, um, he felt that his studio was a place of refuge. So he did hire the models and he gave them a few coins, Theo's coins, of course, but he wanted them to earn something and he would give them something to drink. He felt that they had a little warm place to sit for a while. So at that time he was still thinking about ministry too, you know, but um, yeah. But they are beautiful paintings of people too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, thank you so much. Well, thank you for coming. I, you know, you, I love to talk about it. So. <laughs> anyway, thank you for coming.